this morning, we're going to begin a new worship series uh, called Moses in the Footsteps of the Reluctant Prophet. And while there's a lot of ways that you can explore and dig into the life of Moses, our plan is, is, is going to be this. We're going to look at the historical and the faith and, of course, the scriptural context of Moses, uh, but we're not just going to look at it in a historical sense. We're going to look at his story because I believe that his story has something to say to our story. Although the Bible is an ancient text, I hold firmly to the conviction that its message is timeless and that it is very relevant to our lives today um, if only we will listen to it. And so we're going to look at the whole story of Moses, but we're going to look at it in a way that I hope is going to guide our faith and maybe even guide our own footsteps as we seek to model and walk after him. At the heart of our series is going to be a book, some work that's done by Adam Hamilton. He's a pastor of a church in Kansas City, a Church of the Resurrection. Absolutely love what Adam Hamilton does. He is such a gifted um, educator. He, he really takes complicated um, kind of academic scriptural co concepts of faith, and he, and he brings them home in a very real world and relevant way. And so what we're going to do is, if, if you're tweaked by this, if you're interested in this, I really want to encourage you to go get the book um, of this title. Uh, we've also got a DVD um, that, that comes with a study guide, and so if you'd like to do some deeper studies with that, we want to encourage you to think about that, maybe with your small group or your family or individually. We'd love to offer that to you. Uh, again, just as a reminder, while we're using this as one of our primary sources, we're not going to be following it exact. It, we're not going to be following it exactly. We're going to do some things on our own and do things a little bit differently, uh, and we can't follow their pattern exactly um, in part because um, he preaches for about 40 minutes every Sunday. You thought I talked for a long time, right? You get off easy. Um, there's so much to cover. I don't want to um, rob you of that, nor do I want to keep you here until 1215. Um, so we're going to probably stretch it out a little bit so that we can make sure that we get, um, that we cover everything we want to talk about. The first thing that I want to talk about is just to kind of set the stage uh, for the life of Moses. And that's by looking at uh, where uh, the, the bulk of his life, all of his life really took place. And the first place that I want to point you to um, is in Egypt, because his story is going to start in Egypt. And if you look, this is the Nile River here. Uh, and at the end of the Nile River is the Nile River Basin, which is the most fertile um, kind of land-rich place um, in that area of Egypt. Right here, uh, right over on this part of the, of the Nile River Basin, um, there's a community called the Land of Goshen. I don't know about you, but I find it remarkable that an ancient city would have been named after this little town up the hill. I mean, that, that is just remarkable um, that this little town was so important that this ancient city would be named after that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the land of Goshen here in a little bit. Uh, but the Israelites, uh, they were living there when they began the Exodus. And that Exodus, of course, uh, takes them across the Red Sea uh, into the Sinai Peninsula, where without benefit of GPS, they wandered around a little bit. Uh, until eventually, 40 years later, they made their way up here and crossed over toward the promised land at Gilgal. Um, so that's kind of the geographical uh, place where we're talking about, and we'll revisit this so you can see where it is, because geography plays an important role in this. Um, speaking of geography, uh, when you think about Egypt, uh, what's the architectural feature that immediately comes to mind? Yeah, pyramids. Um, and, and, and there's a reason for that. I mean, they're pretty important. But I want to talk about pyramids a little bit because they're very important to the story of Moses. The first thing that I want to say is that there's some debate as to what years um, Moses lived. But regardless of how people feel about that debate and where he might have lived in terms of actual dates, we do know this. The first pyramid was constructed about a thousand years before Moses was born. And the primary pyramids, the ones you're looking at right now, they existed when he was alive. The pharaohs weren't building pyramids anymore at this point. They were, they were primarily building temples um, were, that, that were kind of this mixture between the worship of the gods and worship of the pharaohs because some people kind of saw them as, as at least semi-divine. Um, but Moses grew up in the shadows of these pyramids. Moses saw these pyramids, walked among these pyramids. But more importantly than having lived in the shadow of the pyramids, Moses lived in the shadow of the men who built the pyramids. And, and the reason that I say men, even though there was no doubt women who helped construct them, I'm talking about the pharaohs. The pharaohs were the ones who had these structures built. And they were built as burial chambers, but they were also built um, to recognize and honor the great power of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was, was one of, if not the most powerful people on the planet. 
in, in charge of nations and armies and, and all these kinds of things. Pharaohs were a formidable presence in the world, and they usually didn't take kindly to people challenging them. They would normally just as soon kill you as to argue with you. But Moses, this person of very little stature, is going to press against Pharaoh in a way that pulls Pharaoh into battle with Moses and ultimately with God. And so we're, we're not dealing with just kind of a casual encounter here. We're dealing with a guy who is called reluctantly to be a prophet who's willing to go and confront one of the most powerful forces in the world. And that would take a tremendous amount of faith and a tremendous amount of bravery. Now, before we can get to the life of Moses, I want to just give you a little bit of context as to the history that leads up to his story. Uh, has anybody ever seen the, the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? It's great. It's a great story. Well, one of our faith ancestors was a guy named Joseph, and, and that musical and that story uh, is based on his life. And Joseph, by the end of his life, uh, was in very strong relationship with the Pharaoh of his day. And in fact, there was a great deal of trust between the two. Uh, they worked together quite well. Um, not only did they work together well, but the trust was so high that Pharaoh made Joseph um, the, kind of the governor of all of Egypt. And so there, he was, Joseph was in, great, was, in a posi- was in a position of great authority and great influence. Uh, not only was the trust level really high, but there was also just a personal affinity. There, w- there was care there. Pharaoh had such a a high regard for Joseph and of the Israelite people um, that Pharaoh gave Joseph and the Israelites the land of Goshen as their permanent settlement where they could go and live and reside permanently. And you'll remember, where, where was that land of Goshen? It was in the Nile River Delta. Right in that place that is that's the richest, most fertile land imaginable. Um, that lets you know how trusted Joseph was by the Egyptian Pharaoh and how close the relationship was. Well, of course, as does happen over time, things change. Uh, Joseph dies. That Pharaoh dies. Even though they're both gone, the Israelite people continued to grow in number. Um, but then a new Pharaoh, a new ruler, uh, comes into power. And I want to share with you how the story of Moses begins according to the first chapter of the book of Exodus. Now, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more, pow- are more powerful than we. So come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Now, now it's, it's important to point out here that there weren't a lot of insurrections that were happening. I mean, the Israelite people were not rising up against the ruling authority and causing problems. They, they were really good neighbors and they contributed in really positive ways, but there was no relationship. There was no understanding. There was no trust. There was no familiarity. Um, And and so uh, this fear began to grow. And the fear for Pharaoh was that this other group, this other religious group from another foreign land, that they would grow in number to the point that their power might exceed the power of Pharaoh, which really, when you think about it, I mean, there's no way that's going to happen. This this, this guy was way more powerful than they were. Um, Well, rather than just get rid of them, Pharaoh wanted to use them as a source of labor. And so he decided to control the Israelites by oppressing them, enslaving them, and making them uh, and putting them into forced labor. And the point here was to break their spirits, but it was also uh, to limit their numbers. The thought was if we really oppress them and really work them hard, they won't continue to grow. And so they'll be tired, they'll be exhausted, they'll be overworked, their numbers will begin to diminish, and everything will be okay. But that's not what happened. In spite of all the oppression, in spite of all the hard work, in spite of all the injustice that was going on, the the, the Israelites, they just grew in number. And they grew more and more and more in number to the point that Pharaoh began to really panic. And it didn't matter how hard he oppressed them. They just continued to rise up in number and in strength. And so finally, he, he, he comes up with really kind of an ultimate solution. He tells the midwives 
who normally are responsible for helping the Israelite women give birth, he tells them that while they are still sitting on the birthing stool, which means while the infant child is really coming into the world, still in the birth canal, that if they see that it is a male, they're to kill the child immediately and to tell the Israelite mother um, that the baby died in childbirth, that it was just a stillborn baby, that it didn't survive um, the pregnancy or that it didn't survive the birth. I mean, that's, you've got to be really afraid to want to do something like that. It's an awful, horrible thought. And as we read that story, we wonder, what is it that could possibly lead a powerful ruler like that to be so afraid of a people that that he's willing to take the lives of of innocent children? You know, fear in and of itself is is not a bad thing. Fear can save our lives. Uh, Fear is a response that I believe has been given to us by God and, and put into us for a very, very important reason. But fear... Um, if if, if we let fear get the best of us, uh, fear can become irrational very, very quickly. And and that's what's happening in this story. Pharaoh is so afraid of what the Israelites are going to do to him, even though they've not threatened anything, his fear gets off the chart. And out of all that fear for this other group, he decides to do something absolutely unspeakable. Fear is driving this. And, and it's not just any fear, it's a, it's a fear that you've probably heard of. And that fear is this, xenophobia. You ever, you ever heard that word before? Yeah. This is what xenophobia is. Xenophobia is fear of the stranger or foreigner. And that's the fear that had gotten into and infected um, this leader. He didn't understand the Israelites, he didn't understand their religion, he knew they were from a foreign land, and he was threatened by them to the point that he felt like he needed to kill them in order to keep them from ever rising into any kind of power. When when you look at the fear of xenophobia, you immediately begin to recognize that it wasn't just a fear that corrupted that Pharaoh and that Egyptian society. When you look at human history, you see that xenophobia, the fear of the other, the fear of the foreigner, has become a fear that has driven some of the darkest chapters in human history. Throughout history, we see this fear rising up in people, and when people in power give, give way to that fear, some awful things have taken place. Now, in the modern era, there, there really is no clearer, greater, or more familiar example than, than what happened um, in Nazi Germany uh, throughout the 1930s and 1940s, right? And in a lot of ways, there's some parallels here. We're even talking about the same group of people, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, a, a, a people from a different land who had a different culture and a different religion. And, and what began to happen is some people who were in power began to distrust them, that they were taking over the banks and they were taking over business and education and all this stuff. And they began to, to develop this, this narrative about the Jewish people that was one of great threat to the German people. And as they developed that narrative, they also began to, to dehumanize the Jewish people to begin to use language that talked about them in ways that made them less than human. And they even used pictures and images that when they would describe them, those pictures and images didn't look like human images. They were distorted to look upsetting and frightening. And they built this whole culture of fear, this xenophobic response to that group of people that they killed millions of them including innocent children. Now, it's important to remember that it wasn't just um, Jewish people who suffered in the Holocaust. It was, it was also people with disabilities, um, uh, people uh, who were homosexual, Roma people, uh, people who had darker skin color than what the Aryan race saw as God's intended perfection. Um, this was xenophobia. This was fear of the other that drove to genocide. That's how irrational that this can be. Now, I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I, I don't want to let ourselves off the hook here. And, and in, the, in the example that I'm about to give, I'm, these are not equivalent examples. Um, but while all of this was happening overseas, you remember what we did here, right? The Japanese internment. We, 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 we imprisoned over 120,000 Japanese people. Why did we imprison them? 
because they were Japanese. Men, women, children, and infants based on a fear of their nationality, where they were from, what they looked like. That was a xenophobic response in that setting. And, and, and while, again, what we did is not on the same level of what happened in Germany, but we can't minimize what we did. Um, what we did was giving in to fear in a way that was unjust and, and not good. And, 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 and even though that didn't end in the same way, that's the first step, my friends. That's a first step towards dehumanizing people to the point where you believe you've got to separate them away because they're too dangerous. What's the next step? It's a stain in our history and a very frightening one. When we give in to fear of the other, um, we're on a slippery slope that, that we've got to walk back from. Now, the good news for us is that the Bible offers a cure for xenophobia. And the cure, according to the book of Romans, is something that is an essential mark for the true Christian. That if you're a true Christian, this is something you have to embody. This is what Paul says a true Christian must embody. Philoxenia is the word that Paul uses in the book of Romans. And as opposed to xenophobia, which is a fear of the stranger, a fear of the foreigner, philoxenia is love of the stranger, love of the foreigner. And, and Paul is telling us that this is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And, and while the word philoxenia is only used twice in the New Testament, and of course it's not used in the, in the Hebrew language at all because it's a Greek word, the, the idea, the notion of philoxenia, the notion of love of the stranger, love of the foreigner, runs all through Scripture. Um, we see it in the Old Testament, and we certainly see it in the New Testament, and it reaches its apex in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, Right? Because Jesus Christ teaches and shows that we are called to love the foreigner, to love the stranger, even to love our enemies. Talk about a radical response to the idea of fears that can take over our lives. This idea of philoxenia is who we are supposed to be as a people. And, and this, is the, uh, this, is the one, this is the way I want to say it. We need to be very careful if our baseline is fear. I know there's a lot to be afraid of in the world right now. I know that. But when our baseline is fear, then that baseline will begin to drive everything upon which we build. That's going to be the foundation. And if the foundation is fear, everything we build on top of that is going to be based on fear. As Christians, our foundation is always and forever love. Love, love, always. And, and I know that sometimes that can feel naive and it can feel like it's posing us, placing us into unnecessary risk and all that stuff. Sure, there's reason that has to enter into this, but our baseline is not fear. Our baseline is love. And everything we build on top of that, even if it's the things that keep us safe from the dangers in this world, if they are founded and based in true love, th then we prevent that slippery slope into which Pharaoh entered and into which people throughout human history have entered including us. Now, um, eventually, uh, it, it becomes clear to, to Pharaoh um, that this plan he had isn't working. And this is why. There were two midwives, Shipra and Puah, who decided that they were not going to carry out Pharaoh's orders. In fact, they would go to the, to, to, to the place in the homes when these Israelite women were giving birth and, and they would bring the child into the world and they would go back to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, why aren't there any dead uh, Hebrew babies? And they would say, well, these Israelite women are so strong that we get word that they're giving birth and by the time we've gotten there, the baby's already born and, and everything's going on and we're not going to take the baby from the mother's hands. We wouldn't do anything like that. And so there's nothing that we can do. And so basically, they were told by the governing authority to go and do something. They decided they weren't going to do that and they went back to the governing authority and they lied. They lied. The, the reason they lied is because um, they couldn't do what Pharaoh was asking them to do and the reason they did that is because they honored God more than they feared Pharaoh. God was the one that they served first. And they were willing to risk their lives in the concept of love of the other 
and not fall into what Pharaoh wanted them to do. Um, and this is another thing that we learn from this story about our own lives. Scripture teaches us very clearly that we're called to be good, good citizens. When we read Scripture, it tells us that we're called to honor the authorities, the governing authorities of the land in which we live. That is a scriptural teaching. However, there are moments that when we read the scriptural story, we see that sometimes there comes a time when the two things become in conflict. Our, our, our dedication to being good citizens and our dedication to being citizens of the Lord. And when those two things come in, come in conflict with one another, um, the priority among them is our service to God. Our commitment to God always supersedes our commitment to any earthly authority. Always and forever. And, and that's what was happening in this story. They were serving God before the human authority. Now, to be clear, we have to be careful when we do this. Civil disobedience reacting against unjust laws and unjust commandments that come from civil authorities is an effective and important way for us to press back against injustice. We saw that in the civil rights movement. Those were unjust, inappropriate laws that were codified by human governing authorities. And they were laws that oppressed people based on the color of their skin. They were wrong fundamentally. And there were people who said it doesn't matter that they're wrong, they're the law, and to be good faithful citizens, we got to live into that. But there was another set of people that said no, God's law is higher, and God's law says we were all made in God's image, and this is not appropriate. And so they began to sit at counters and sit in, in, in seats and buses where they weren't supposed to be. And they began to hold up a mirror to the world. And that mirror reflected back God's love in the face of injustice, racism, and all those kinds of things. It was absolutely an appropriate example of when civil disobedience, when service to God over service to civil authorities can change the world in the right way. But how do we know it's the right way? How do we know that what we see as an injustice is what God sees as an injustice? Because I don't know if, this, if, if you all have noticed this, people have a wide variety of opinions when it comes to social issues and what's just and what's unjust, don't we? We really do. And, and so what may be just to me, what may make me want to rise up out of my seat and go stand on a street corner and do everything I can to end this unjust practice that feels to me as being put upon the world by a civil authority, I can be on one side of the street deeply convicted that I'm doing the right thing for the sake of the Lord. And guess who could be on the other side? You. Because you may believe that for the sake of the Lord, the right thing is exactly opposite to what I believe the right thing to be. And, and that's what makes a church like this so important. Because in a church like this, we've got both of those voices and we need each other to keep each other in check. Because if I don't have you to keep me in check and you don't have me to keep you in check, we, we, we enter into an echo chamber. And, and we begin to kind of spiral into the belief that our beliefs are what God believes. And that's a really slippery slope. We've got to hold each other accountable. We've got to be in dialogue with each other. And in this church, we really are set up in a way and we believe this firmly that if there was some moment where civil disobedience might be the cause, there's going to be people in this church who are going to be on, on different sides of that. And that, my friends, is a great sign for who we are. And we want to cling to that, and we want to hold on to that, because it's so very, very important. But there does become times when we've got to pay attention to what's going on, because our faith is calling us to something higher than the governing authority. Um, now, uh, here's one last thing I want to tell you about this story. Um, we have no, this is pretty powerful. We know the names of Shipra and Pua, who were the midwives who did this act of civil disobedience to save these um, infants' lives. Uh, we know their names, but guess whose name we don't know? We have no idea who this Pharaoh was. And they all had names. And Scripture intentionally leaves the name of this Pharaoh out of the book. How do you think the most powerful man in the world at that time would feel about the fact that those two women who avoided and didn't do what he commanded them to do were the names that we remember this morning in worship and we have no idea who he is? It tells you a little something about God, doesn't it? God doesn't necessarily honor the things that this world honors. God honors those who honor God. And when we live to seek in God's way, we discover what those midwives did. God blessed them and God cared for them and God took care of their families. 
Now, if you know how this story ends, you know it doesn't end well. The fear grips Pharaoh so much to the point that um, he begins to actually order his, his uh, soldiers and, his, and the governing authority to go and take the babies from the arms of their parents and to throw them into the Nile River, every male child. I can't imagine a more horrifying experience than that. In the midst of that moment, a baby's born. His name is Moses. And Moses is placed into a basket by his mother. And her only salvation for her son is to put him in the waters where the other babies are being thrown to drown. We're going to pick up here uh, next week. Uh, But in the meantime, uh, my hope for all of us is that we will seek to be a people whose baseline is love. That philoxenia is the way that we operate in our daily lives and we will do everything we can to make sure that we serve God before all else. And if we do those things, we will be walking in the footsteps of the reluctant prophet who made such an amazing difference that he changed the world. May we do the same. Amen.